What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, H-A-W-G sports.com. Today on the show, we're going to take one last look back at Arkansas's loss to the Florida Gators, 63-35 on Saturday, and of course, jump ahead and look at LSU. We've got a few other things to talk about as well, uh, and we'll also get to your questions. All that and more on Hog Sports Live. So Arkansas dropping this last game, obviously 63-35. More points than you'd like to see Arkansas give up. There are a lot of factors to that, and we'll get into that more, but I want to get into a few housekeeping things first. Before we get started, of course, I want to remind you there's plenty of ways to watch and listen. You can always tune in on Facebook Live. Be sure to follow the page if you have not done so already. Recommend it to somebody else if you think they might like it. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notifications bell so you're notified any time we upload new videos. Throw us a thumbs up or a like on both of those channels if you like the content that we're producing. And also on Apple Podcasts, let other people know what they can expect with a five-star rating and leave a review if you want to. We would certainly appreciate that. Helps boost the algorithm, helps helps other people know what to expect and, and that other people like the content as well. Also available on Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere else you can think of to find your favorite podcast. Also sign up for our daily newsletter. We also send breaking news newsletters like we did today when there was a couple of breaking news items. So you would have gotten that in your email inbox along with other free Razorback content. 75% of the content we send in our newsletter is free. You should also sign up for breaking news text alerts, which, again, we also send directly to your uh, phone so you know ahead of any of your buddies. You can stay ahead of them on your group thread or whatnot. Uh, but those are two great resources to stay up to date with Razorback News uh, and our free content at Hogsports. Just go to the top right of the page. You'll see the three dots or the three lines, depending on if you're mobile or, or on your computer, and you'll see where to sign up there. Okay. A little bit of injury news, first of all. So, Devion Warren has been lost for the season. He has an ACL tear. Uh, he can return next year. He is a senior, but he does have the option of returning next year. He's kind of indicated that that might be something in the cards for him, and I think Arkansas would like to have him back. So, it's unfortunate for Devion. He was having a really good start to the season. What do you have, 33? He had seven catches for 33 yards in his three-year career before this season. And through seven games, he had 15 catches for 278 yards and three touchdowns and also had 35 rushing yards. So having his best season to date, be nice to get Debbie on back. He, he's certainly been a really good player for Arkansas this season. Other injury updates, obviously Arkansas was without Levi Draper, Micah Smith, Bo Lemmer, Noah Gatlin, Deion Edwards, Dominic Edwards, and Hudson Henry in the game. Felipe Franks hurt his wrist, uh, his left wrist, I think, and, and returned. Uh, I think I think he's going to be fine. I don't, there's no no reason to think that he's he's going to be out. Devion Warren, of course, not uh, not returning there. Hudson Henry is expected to be back at practice today, and they hope he'll make his return this weekend. Noah Gatlin and Bo Lemmer, between those two, Sam Pittman said they they hope to get one of them back this week. Maybe maybe both, but they hope to get one. If I had to guess on which one that would be, I. I kind of think it would be Gatlin, just based on what I've heard. Blake Kern, Joe Fouché, both expected to be back this week. Uh, both back to uh, at some point this week, anyway, for practice. Blake Kern and Joe Fouché. So that's that's the latest on Razorback injuries for LSU. Obviously, they have not played. It'll be three weeks since they've played a football game. I mean, so this game is set for 11 a.m. It's going to be televised by ESPN or the SEC Network. And unfortunately, 11 a.m. 11 a. games kind of suck. I mean, you'd rather have an, e uh, an evening game or a, a mid-afternoon game, but it is what it is, to use a terrible saying. And the Missouri game, unfortunately, the following weekend is also set for 11 a.m., which means I'm going to miss both my daughter's basketball games that I coach. That sucks. But Arkansas got a chance in both of these games. They got a chance to, to win both of them. Looking at LSU's schedule, so the last time they played, they lost 48-11 to to Auburn. 48-11. to That was on Halloween night. The Alabama game was postponed the, fall, the following weekend. Excuse me. They had a bye. Then the Alabama game gets postponed, and then it's Arkansas up at 11 a.m. 
So Ed Orgeron says they should get most of their quarantine players back. There has been one game already postponed in the SEC. The Ole Miss-Texas A&M game has been postponed. Ole Miss plays. Ole Miss has their, their other open date filled. So it looks like December 12th is the opportunity. No, excuse me, December 9th. December 12th, Ole Miss already has that weekend filled. So December 19th. So that's assuming that it, Texas A&M doesn't make the SEC championship game. Which is obviously, I mean, they're kind of behind the sticks on that one. Not not out of the realm of possibility with Alabama, but Alabama would have to lose two games. That ain't happening, right? Will Muschamp's out. He's been fired. I don't know if this is surprising, you know, given the way that, you know, their their season has gone these last few weeks, but you kind of thought last year was a possibility for them to get for him to get fired. I mean, he did have a little bit more to go on. I mean, he had, he wasn't that far removed from the 9-win season that they had, and I think they went 7 wins the next year. And so it would have been the first like losing year if he'd gotten fired last year in year 4, but they they went 1 and four or one in five, I think, down the stretch. They beat Georgia in two overtimes, which was a huge signature type of win. And then instead of that snowballing into momentum, they went like one in five the last the last six games. So he survived that and, you know, they started off bad and it's been bad these last few weeks. They gave up fifty nine to Ole Miss and that's what happens in this world. He's gonna be okay. He's going to be all right, so you don't have to worry about him too much. He is getting like $13 million out of this deal. But, you know, I, I'd said earlier that I could see a situation where coaches that you normally thought would get fired don't get fired this year, given the state of things with coronavirus and stuff. Not, not so much the case. So uh, they're, still, they're still firing coaches in the SEC uh, and midseason also. So tough break for, uh, for Will Muschamp, but, I mean – he had five years. They just didn't – they just kind of – they went up a little bit and then they just kind of, you know, kept going down. So, that's that's what happens. you got to win in this conference. you got to win in college football period. So, back to the game on Saturday. I don't know that you can be outraged because they lost. Now, you can be disappointed that they gave up 63 points, obviously. I felt like, you know – I don't know if I said it on this show or on drive time or what, but my thought was you need to really do whatever you can to hit Kyle Trask as much as possible. And they didn't do that so much. Maybe they tried to and they didn't get away with it, but they ran some three-man front, some four-man front. They brought some blitzes at times, but um, really, I mean, he was on. Arkansas didn't catch a lot of breaks. So here's some of the things that had to go differently for Arkansas to even have a chance in this one. On third and seven with 318 to play in the first – you had that uh, Trayvon Grimes catch, like that was so that was tipped up in the air by Hudson Clark, and the guy basically pins it to his helmet and catches the ball. Spectacular catch, but things like that need to go the other way if you're Arkansas. Like you need to catch all the breaks to have a chance to beat a team like Florida in the stages that you are. I mean, Florida's in year three under Muschamp or under Muschamp. I don't want to take you back to that Florida fans, <laughs> uh, but they're in, in year three under Dan Mullen, and again, like I said in the walk and talk, they've been. It's not like they hadn't been recruiting well before he got there. So something like that needed to go a different way. Um, you know, it happened again, I think, the next series where they made another spectacular catch, but Arkansas actually got away with a uh, with a face mask penalty and uh, on Trask, and, and he threw the ball long. You know, those are the kind of things that Arkansas needed to get away with, you know, time after time. Um, on their touchdown pass, their first touchdown pass, I thought Gamble – I thought Gamble held um, Hudson Clark. I th- you know, it was brief, but I thought that was a that was good enough for a holding call. I could see it going both ways, but again, those are the kind of things that need to to happen for Arkansas. They need to get that holding call right there. Okay, so it didn't go their way. Uh, Arkansas needed to be the team that had three penalties for thirty five yards, not the team that had nine penalties for seventy nine yards. That is not. That's not the right ingredient for the formula of winning an SEC road game, especially against a, you know, that's number six team in the country. With 15 seconds to go in the first quarter, Arkansas came up a half a yard shy on that 14 yard run by Franks. Obviously, they needed to get that, but just as important and more importantly, 
when they did decide to go for it on fourth and a little under a yard, Franks needed to see Traylon Burks there on the sideline wide open. You could see Kendall Bryles jumping into the air three times when he threw to Mike Woods. You could see him in the frame. That was a tough one. That needed to be a 51-yarder, 51-yard touchdown. And what's crazy is Franks was 5 of 6 passing at that point for 77 yards, which looks pretty solid, but how sweet (laughs) would it have been if he was 6 of 6 passing for 126 yards and a touchdown? And a touchdown to Burks, I should say. That that would have given Arkansas a 14-7 lead. You know, something like that can kind of change a game. You know, you have a couple big – I guess he had the touchdown pass, the 40, so he had two touchdown passes. He had the 47-yarder, and he would have had a 51-yarder. I mean, that would have changed the way, you know, Florida players, Florida coaches, the stands, everybody felt about that game at that point if he hits that pass. So that was a critical one. You can't miss plays like that. And, you know, you turn it around the other side after that. Uh, Arkansas had a busted coverage on the following series, and Kyle Trask, of course, made Arkansas pay with a 23-yard touchdown pass to Grimes. Arkansas didn't need two false start penalties on their third possession, leaving them in a third and 14 and wiping out a 10-yard run by Traylon Smith, forced to punt. They didn't need their second straight holding flag as they started their fifth possession with 428 to play in the first half, setting them up at their own 11-yard line. It was on the kickoff, which they were holding a lot on kickoff. There was one time where it wasn't called on Devion's long run. It wasn't, there wasn't a holding call called, and I, I saw two people for Arkansas holding the ball, like quit holding it's like special teams, there's something every damn game in special teams that's just like, what are you doing? It's got to be frustrating. Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> 428 to play in the first half. Arkansas needed to go down and score, but they ended up setting up at their own 11-yard line down 28-14. They needed to at least take the clock down to go in the halftime or ideally score, make it a one-score game, come back and get the ball. They did score right out of halftime tie it but instead instead of keeping it to you know two scores and coming out and scoring and making it a seven point game or or you know scoring and making a seven point game and then scoring again right out of half and tying it up they gave Florida the ball back with plenty of time and Florida ended up scoring with 17 seconds left to make it 35 14 all those things right before half are so critical especially when you're thinking about who gets the ball next it's 35 14 at that point that's the ball game pretty much I mean with Florida's offense as explosive as they are, Arkansas is not coming back from 35-14. Just not. With 8.06 left to play in the third quarter, Blake Kern needed to shuck that 191-pound Florida DB Marco Wilson at the 34-yard line, one yard shy of the line to gain. Kern usually does that. The guy got him real good, it looked like, on the, on the collar and, and brought him down. And finally, Traylon Burke's got to have more than three catches, more than five touches total. He had five touches total. He had two rushes. One of them was a decent game. One of them wasn't. By decent, I mean just a few yards. But Traylon Burke's needs more like 10 touches, 15 touches, I think. Don't start that. Don't start not getting into the ball too much. He's got to get the ball. Overall, where they are right now, Arkansas has exceeded expectations. I don't think there's any question about that. So you should be enjoying this season. And I know there are some people out there that can't accept anything but greatness. And I understand having high standards. I mean, and living and dying on every play, that's what makes college football so much fun. But there's a difference in having really high standards and not understanding how college football works. Because I see some people like outraged that Arkansas lost that game. 17 and a half point underdog. So you don't get to just go like two and 10 and then leapfrog to 10 and two overnight. And the schools that do have that kind of success, I mean, very, I don't, you'd have to find some examples. I mean, like you can go make maybe Arkansas won four games and won nine games in 98, 97, 98. But the teams that usually do have turnarounds like that, it's usually not like sustained. Maybe everything worked out just right. But Arkansas's beaten every team that they've had. A, like, if you've gone into a game saying Arkansas's got a legitimate shot to win this game, if you've gone into a game saying that, Arkansas has won. 
aside from the Auburn game, which, again, I think most of us would agree, I know that most of us agree, that Arkansas was robbed by referee error in that one. Robbed twice, robbed by the call on the field and then the mistake on the replay. Robbed twice in that one. But Arkansas was 27.5 point dogs to Georgia, lost by 27. Obviously, they played. That ended up being a bigger gap than maybe what the game was. I mean, for the whole first half, Arkansas was fantastic on defense. 17.5 point dogs against Mississippi State. Remember that one? Most delusional fan base in the SEC, Arkansas. That's what Mississippi State fans called you. Arkansas won 21 14. 13 and a half point dogs at Auburn. They lost, air quotes for those listening, 30 to 28. One and a half point dogs to Ole Miss, 130 with 30, 21. 13 and a half point dogs to Texas AM, lost by 11, 42 31. One and a half point dogs against Tennessee, 124 13. And 17 and a half point dogs against Florida and lost by 28. So I guess they were kind of due. For one, they've gone six straight weeks with that with covering, and uh, they did not against Florida. Against LSU, Arkansas is one-and-a-half-point favorites. It's the first time this season that Arkansas has been favored. The first time. So, I don't know why it's hard for some people to accept that these guys are overachieving and expecting just like overnight turnaround. And one of the things that bugs me sometimes that this happens with like you're angry, like I imagine just like your angry hog fan, you know, just looking at everything – unacceptable, inexcusable, just enraged. And I get it. I've been there for good reason. I mean, when you make a mockery of the most recognizable logo in this state, you're going to draw wrath from me. And that's what happened last year with Chad Morse. Okay? Everybody knows that. Everybody saw my walk and talk. It's watching this, I'm sure. But there's a there's a guy out there who's like, Every time, like if I were to say this is why Arkansas lost because they didn't have this guy or that guy, they don't have the talent, they're like, that's just an excuse. Like, I'm not making excuses for myself. I'm making excuses for Arkansas, and there are plenty of excuses. There's room for excuses. I don't know where this narrative got. Like, you can't make an excuse for yourself. Like, coach sits here and goes, this is not an overnight rebuild, you know, or this thing was broke when we got here. Or, um, you know, got to get some more players, got to address it in recruiting. You know, if you say stuff like that, that makes you sound like you're making a bunch of excuses. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say anything other than I'm an idiot for calling my roofer last week when I meant to call Bob Redman from 24-7, from Swamp 24-7. I'm an idiot. I made a mistake. Now, if I was saying, well, these new iPhones, you know, that's an excuse. And that makes me kind of sound like a wimp. I wanted to use another word, but I inserted wimp. So you understand what I'm saying. So I can, I can, like, I, like if I'm sitting here going like, you know, Trevor Burbick, he doesn't have the chin to stand toe to toe with Mike Tyson. Oh, that's an excuse. You know, no, it's why he lost. It's why he got knocked out cold. So anyway, I, I, I just don't understand. I think you're misunderstanding like what that means. Like you don't make excuse for yourself, but like for me, excusing what Arkansas does because of this or that or that factor or that factor. Those are excuses, but that's, there's nothing wrong with, with that. I'm not like – I'm not Arkansas. I'm not, I'm not the, one of the coaches or the players. I'm a critic. So, by the way, Bobby Petrino's first year at Arkansas, they lost to Alabama 49-14, they lost to Texas 52-10, and they lost to Florida 38-7. They were not in a position to beat those teams. You can't just expect us to jump over everything. You know, this is kind of an offshoot of that, but, like, another thing that I think people – that kind of bugs me is like when people say, and a lot of people, you, you listening probably have said this, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That's what you hear whenever Arkansas loses. Somebody calls into a radio show, tells you the definition of, ex, of insanity. That's actually – the definition of a word called preservation. If you look up preservation, that is the definition of that word. Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin never said that's the definition of insanity. That's a myth. It's the definition of the word perseveration. Perseveration. That's a word you never use for anything, I'm sure. But it's literally the definition of that word, not insanity. Anyway, a little off track. 
same vein. I'm still standing up for Felipe Franks, even though you look on paper, you know, what he did in that game on Saturday. Um, what was he like? 13 of 15 or something. I can't remember what he was. It was like, but it was ridiculously accurate. Um, when you look at it on paper, he missed the throw to Traylon Burks. That was a big one. He holds the ball too long. He's not perfect. He's the best quarterback Arkansas has had in five years, though. Over ten quarterbacks, still the best quarterback he's had. And let me let me support that with a little bit of stuff. Again, is he a world beater? Is he a Heisman candidate? No. But what did we say going into this season? If Felipe Franks can just be average, if he can just be average, Arkansas might win a couple of games. But he's been better than average. He is. He has a passing. Uh, he has a passer rating. That is 161.27, 161.27. That's better than Quinn Grovey. This in their best years. Quinn, Barry Lunny, Clint Sterner, Matt Jones, Tyler Wilson, Austin Allen, none of those guys ever had an efficiency rating as high as Felipe Franks did, does right now. The only guys in like SEC era, Ryan Mallett, Brandon Allen, 163.6 for Mallett, 166.5 for Brandon Allen in their best years as starters. And I'll say this, too. Felipe's done this against seven straight SEC teams, okay? He hasn't gotten to play UTEP, UT Martin, Tennessee Tech, ULM. Toledo was on there for Brandon Allen also. But he hadn't, he hadn't had the luxury of playing those games, okay? The record, the SEC, or excuse me, the Arkansas all-time record, this has stood for 40 years, for completion percentage is 66.2 set by Kevin Scanlon, 1979. Felipe Franks' passing completion percentage is 68.3. Again, the record, 66.2. Franks, 68.3. He's got a great shot to break the record for complete. I mean, think about all the quarterbacks that have come through since 1979. Pretty impressive. Now, as Barry Lunny Jr. will tell you, Barry Lunny didn't have jet sweeps where you just, you know, not a lot of shovel passes going on, not all these passes straight to the flats, all these screen passes and stuff. So that's a factor. But still, they've been doing that for a while and nobody's passed that mark. So standing up for Felipe a little bit. I don't mean to diminish anything anybody else has done either. But there's been 10 starting quarterbacks since 2016 at Arkansas. Is that right? Yeah. 2017. 2017, there's been 10 starting quarterbacks at Arkansas. So perspective, again, people. I know you're passionate. I know you can feel your blood boiling. I know how it feels. That's what makes it fun, though. It's that roller coaster, the highs and the lows. Without the sour, the sweet ain't a sweet vanilla sky. Remember that. I mean, you could you could feel like you could just punch somebody in the face one play, and then the next play is just bliss, right? That's what makes college football so much fun. Arkansas's offensive line is still – and, again, I don't mean to diminish anything these guys are doing because these guys are playing their ass off. They are. They're working, they're buying in, they're believing just like anybody else. But you've got some guys out there in the SEC, you know, and they've got a 6'6", 330-pounder, you know, and they've worked to trim his weight. And you've got, you know, Arkansas is like, we got to get weight on these guys. And I would think that, like, if you're heading into this season, you're like, yeah, I'm down from 340, I'm 330, 320 now. I, I trim some weight, you know. One of these guys that were just massive, they came into the school just massive. I would think that you're going to feel lighter, quicker, all those things. The other side, you may feel stronger, but I would think that's more of an adjustment to like add like 35 pounds like Myron Cunningham and Ricky Stromberg did. And there's some other guys that got to add some weight. And different people carry weight differently. But I'll say this. The most highly rated offensive line Arkansas has faced this year was Tennessee. They had four five-stars and one four-star. 24 stars across the board. That's not the best line Arkansas has faced. The best lines they have faced were Texas A&M and Florida. What do those two lines have in common? Both had four seniors. A lot of experience on both of those units. It makes a difference having that experience, having good players first of all. But you know, if you want to look, if you want to look at 
Florida's offensive line or um, uh, uh, Texas A&M's offensive line, it's not like super highly regarded guys. I mean, there's a lot of like number 900 ranked player in the country, number 1100 ranked player in the country. I mean, Texas A&M had one five star and their left guard, who was the, who was the sophomore. The four seniors were all three stars. Tennis, uh, Florida's kind of similar. I think they've got two four stars and all the rest are three stars. And again, like, you know, 700 ranked player in the country, you know, not like just like three stars, but exceedingly well recruited and stuff. So it just goes to show that it's important to be in a system for a long time. And, you know, also under a specific head coach that, that absolutely, absolutely helps. Most of those programs are in year three under their coaches. So it's kind of my thoughts on that. What if I told you, though, that, like, the start of this year, in addition to everything else I was going to tell you, that, like, Jalen Catalan is going to be the best safety and he's only a redshirt freshman that Arkansas has had since Ken Hamlin. Or Arkansas is going to, you know, do this and that and, you know, hold Georgia to like they did. Or, you know, just all the things that they've accomplished. And then I, at the end of it, I tell you, and, and what if I told you that Arkansas is going to face the defending national champions and they're going to be one-and-a-half-point favorites? I mean, you might have called – the loony bin on me. LSU's lost a lot, though. I mean, they've lost several starters. I think they have, what, 13 or 14 players drafted in the NFL, a ton of first-rounders. I mean, they lost a lot. And then a lot of players opted out also. A lot of players opted out. They lost both coordinators. Well, Joe Brady wasn't technically – he was technically co-coordinator, but I think we know what his role was. So, lost a lot. Last year, Ed Orgeron said they don't, they're not going to celebrate beating Arkansas because Arkansas hadn't beaten anybody in a long time. A little bit different. A little bit different this year. Flip it a little bit. Here's the numbers on those Texas A&M players. I knew I had that written down somewhere. So, Kenyon Green was the five-star. The other four are seniors. Those players are ranked for Texas A&M, starting offensive line. The other four stars are seniors. This is what they are ranked, their recruiting ranking. Number seven overall in the country, 752, 1,394, 980, 1,164. Best offensive line Arkansas's face, maybe. If it's not them, it's Florida. So when you get past, again, four senior starters, you get past a couple of guys, you know, who were top 100 play. One guy was a top 100. One guy was just outside the top 100. The other three were ranked number 976 nationally, number 547, number 409. So a little bit more highly regarded in Florida than the Texas A&M players, but still three three stars. I just saw somebody like said, you know, you got to stop recruiting three stars on the offensive line. You got to get the four stars, five stars. That's not always true. Yes, it helps. The odds much better that they're going to be great players. This Tennessee offensive line, I'm sure one day they'll be fantastic. But that, that experience helps a lot. It goes a long way. Do we want to look at some stats and stuff real quick? Where's Arkansas in scoring offense, stuff like that? Arkansas is right now ninth in the SEC with 26 points a game in scoring offense. Total offense. Seventh, 388.3. It's definitely improvement over last year. The passing offense has slowly ticked up. They're now eighth at 240, 240.1 yards per game. The rushing offense, eighth, 148.14. That has really ticked up. That's been the thing that's really ticked up for them. I mean, they didn't start off very good running the ball, but they've slowly picked it up, 148.14. Helps when you have 82, 83-yard touchdown runs. As far as passing right now, Felipe Franks is the fourth-rated passer in the SEC, 161.27, as I mentioned earlier. He's, completing, he's completed 202 of 138 passes, 68.3%, 1,678 yards, 16 touchdowns, three interceptions. That's 239.7 yards per game. That's not bad. I mean, yes, there are some things. I mean, it's all on paper, and there are some things during games where you're just like, oh, so close. (laughs) 
But again, it's it's hard for me to say much negative about Felipe considering the perspective I have on where Arkansas has been as a program and the rage that I know all of you have experienced along with me. Defensively, Arkansas is 10th in total defense, 428.9. I guess what matters a little bit more is scoring defense where they're 8th at 31.4 points allowed per game. Rush defense, 12th, 183.43. Not a good number. And the average is bad, 4.4. I mean, it's not horrendous, but it's not good. It's not great. It's not, it's not very good. Pass defense, they've dropped a little bit. They were the number one pass efficiency defense in the SEC. They have dropped to third, not too far, by like six points. Uh, they have dropped to third, 130.94, allowing 245 yards per game, which is fifth. That's where they are right now on defense. Sacks allowed, Arkansas is last. 23, 23 sacks. Some of that's the offensive line. Some of that's Felipe Franks. But they're dead last by three sacks, so they're significantly last. On the flip side, Arkansas is tied for seventh with 12 sacks made. Traylon Burks has surpassed every Arkansas wide receiver last year in receiving. He currently ranks eighth in the SEC with 34 catches, which is more than anybody had last year, 508 yards, which is more than anybody had last year, and he also has five touchdown catches, 84.7 yards per game. Good season for Traylon. Rushing right now, does anybody have anybody at Arkansas up there? Rakeem is 18th, 309 yards rushing. Traylon Smith is 10th, so Traylon Smith is in the top 10 with 441 Averaging 5.7 yards per carry right now. So that's a good number for Traylon. And he's kind of picking it up more and more to a point where you're like, maybe Traylon should be getting more carries at this point. You know, and I, I think Rakeem is probably – I don't like when I see stuff like – I see people like say stuff like so-and-so is soft or he's not running hard or this. You don't know what he's dealing with. He could have – his toe could be halfway knocked off. I mean, you don't know what kind of injuries players are dealing with. He could have a shoulder. He's had shoulders in his in his – in his history, you know. So I always kind of frown when people say stuff like that because you don't know what they're dealing with. So we'll kind of leave it at that. Tackles, that's another good stat for Arkansas. Grant Morgan leading the SEC with 12.14 tackles per game. Has 85 total tackles. Bumper pool is fourth with 11.83 per game. He has got 71 total and he has missed a game. Jalen Catalan is fifth with 10 tackles per game. I guess we could go interceptions because I think Arkansas is still in pretty good shape there too. Interceptions. Hudson Clark still has three interceptions all in one game to rank tied for first along with Jalen Catalan, who is also tied for first with three and has a pick six. Total interceptions. Arkansas still leading the SEC with 13. Easily leading the SEC. All right, people. How long have we gone here? 33 minutes. It's a long time for me just to talk. I'm going to get to your questions here. But first, I want to say this. I'm not going to promote the um, the special that we have because I want you to wait. I want you to wait a day, okay? I want you to go to hogsports.com tomorrow morning or at midnight tonight, whatever. And I want you to log on to the site because you're going to like what you see, Okay. I'm not telling you not to sign up today, but I am telling you just to wait a little bit. All right. A lot of that Black Friday stuff starting to kind of come around. So you want to hold out a little bit. But still check out all our free content at Hog Sports. Plenty of ways to watch and listen. Of course, you can always tune in on Facebook Live and tune in on YouTube. Be sure to follow the page on Facebook Live and uh, subscribe to the channel on YouTube and throw a notification bell click there. I like how I came around with that. Notification bell click. So you're notified anytime we upload new videos. Also available on Apple Podcasts. Throw us that five-star rating and leave a review and available anywhere else you can think of to find your favorite podcast. Be sure to sign up for the newsletter. Go to the top right of the page or text alerts or both. Take you about 15 seconds to do both of those. I think with the newsletter, you get an activation email. You can cancel them at any time, but 
You know, it's not like something we tease you. We're just going to send you free information, okay? Free Razorback breaking news. Now, we kind of break things down a little bit differently on how we do our free content. Free stuff is stuff that comes out of press conferences, stuff that's already happened, our VIP stuff, largely recruiting, stuff that hasn't happened yet, insider stuff, access to our message board, crystal ball predictions on recruits, things like that. So, but again, just give it a day. Give it a day on that, uh, on your sign up. All right, let's turn to your questions now. We're going straight to Facebook Live. Timothy David Long says he's proud of the Hogs. Let's go get LSU. Let's get LSU. Adrian Jones says go Hogs, take back the boot. Sherry Carter says go Hogs, get that boot. A lot of people want the boot back. It's been a while. With Warren's injury, do you think they will put Knox back in his place? It's possible. I don't know if that means um, that they would shift Traylon Burke somewhere. I mean, Traylon's still been playing the slot, so it's it's possible that they put Knox there. They could go with Tyson Morris. I don't know. I know that you know Sam Pittman said there's some things that they want Knox to do better. They want him to practice better. They want him to run but routes better. Obviously, he didn't make the most of his last couple of opportunities with a couple of drops. But he's kind of been a guy that's a mystery. Also, I should mention, you know, speaking of mysteries, you know, Devin Bush, we've gotten a lot of questions. Is Devin Bush hurt? What's the situation with him? Um, and he's just had a shoulder. You know, it's kind of it's just kind of setting back. So he's been dealing with that. Chase Hogan Jones kind of answers the same thing. Who do you feel, see Phil and Debbie on Warren's role in special teams? Got to be Burks, right? I think it could be Burks. They like Perotti as a return guy. He's been at least reliable, but. To me, if Burks is only going to touch the ball, you know, five times, then he needs to be doing everything he can in the return game. Philip Doolin says we are three and two, four and one against teams we were originally scheduled to play this season. It's a good point, Philip. weren't supposed to play Florida. weren't pl- weren't supposed to play Georgia. I mean, I think based on what we've seen, it's a pretty good bet that Arkansas was going to win three of those four non-conference games. Who knows on Notre Dame? Maybe they would have shocked them. Maybe Notre Dame would have took them lightly. Notre Dame didn't play Duke very well in the week that they were supposed to play Arkansas. So maybe there's a universal magnetic something that caused that, and Arkansas would have – who knows. But that's a good point, Philip. Marcus Holmes says, question, will Coach Sam Pittman be back this weekend? Yes, Sam Pittman, I think they'll got to – you know, they'll do the heart, the heart screening for him. Excuse me, but he's he's gone through everything that he's got to go through. He he feels fine. He had a little bit of back pain that kind of moved up through his shoulders. Never had any kind of cold symptoms or anything like that. Um, we talked to him today. He's in his uh, pool house still quarantining, but he will rejoin the team on Wednesday. And there's nothing else that he needs to do moving forward. He just he will return the team on Wednesday with the team Wednesday. They'll do the you know the heart scan thing, which hasn't been as big a deal as I think they thought it was going to be. At least right now, things change with this virus, obviously. Some good news on the virus front, on the vaccine front at least. I mean, I know there are people that are controversial on that, on whether they'll take it or not, or whether they believe in it or not. But the Moderna one, I think, has like 95% efficacy. Is that the right word? <laughs> but 95%, which is pretty solid. I don't think it has to be stored at the cold temperature that the Pfizer one does. The Pfizer one is a two-stage, 21-day. They have 95, 90% positive results on that one. So for me personally, um, after everybody gets it that I think needs it, you know, in terms of the elderly, people with pre-existing conditions, stuff like that, then I think I'll probably get it. I mean, that's my opinion. You may have a different one. Ryan Horn says, everyone needs to remember this team won zero SEC games for two years. We aren't going to win every SEC game. Florida's full of five-star experienced talent. We're just not good enough to beat them yet. It's not the coach or the player's fault. Got to recruit decent talent. Doesn't have to be four or even five star talent. We got to recruit good football players and also get in the system a little bit longer. I mean, let's not forget, you know, that these teams that Arkansas is facing, like Florida, they've been working with Dan Mullen for three years. Kyle Trask is a returning starter at quarterback. You know, they've got a veteran offensive line, right? How big is a veteran offensive line right now? I think it's pretty important. Arkansas has got some new starters. They've shoveled some things around. They've had some injuries up front on the offensive line, um, new quarterback. I mean, there's a lot of things with Arkansas that, you know, could obviously have factored in with, you know, the state of things with coronavirus, having to not have to go through spring, you know, just the way things were sh- uh, shifted around. So I think that absolutely plays a role for some teams, especially the teams that have some continuity going on with their coaching staff and with their players who are returning. Arkansas didn't really have that. My uh, 
beard is tickling my neck. You know what? I always grow a beard in November. I do the no shave November. It's just an excuse to, I mean, obviously I want awareness. Nobody's ever asked me why I'm growing a beard. And I don't know if I've said, you know, to raise awareness for prostate cancer, but that's why we're, we do it right. You raise awareness for prostate cancer. Oops. You raise awareness for prostate cancer, right? Um, but right now everybody's wearing a mask when you go out. So, and my mask, it, it kind of itches having that on my face the whole time. I just noticed it at my daughter's. We had like, you know, 45 minute basketball practice and then they play their game. So they practice and play on the same day, which is a lot of time for a seven year old to be on a basketball court, by the way. But I just noticed it because that's like the first time in a while I've had to really wear it for a long time with having some facial hair like this. I think I might shave it off just because it's a little uncomfortable. Marco Giles says, Trey, do you think this game plus a good raise will make Odom want to stay here as DC instead of pursuing other head coaching positions elsewhere? I don't know. I kind of think that he'll be here maybe another year before he starts entertaining that idea. I would hope that's the case. But I think he's definitely deserving of a raise, what he's done. I mean, obviously that Florida game, everybody's going to have an anomaly like that. But I think he's done some good things. I think you got to be proud of the job overall the defense has done most games this year. Timothy David Long says, hey, Trey, what's your pick for the Heisman this year? Trask is making a good case for it. I don't care what anybody says. He's making a, a really good case to be the Heisman winner. I mean, when you compare his stats to other players right now, and I do have a Heisman vote. Right now, I think maybe Trask might be my leader, to be honest. Timothy David Long says, think we had the most penalties against Florida than any game this year, maybe due to Coach Pivot not being there. Yeah, and I'll tell you something else. Maybe, you know, it could have been a negative also having Barry Odom with so much on his plate, not being able to maybe make adjustments as well or not having his eyes up there in the booth. Those could all have played a role too. I don't think that any of that was enough to beat Florida, especially the way Trash was throwing the ball. But I think that's a fair point that maybe – Maybe that factored into some things like penalties, like maybe not, maybe giving up a lot of points. Tim Hudson says, so here's my question, which you may have touched on already. I know Trask is really good, but did he play like insanely good on Saturday or did the secondary just take a step back and not have a good night? Would love your input. I think that Arkansas probably should have tried to hit him, maybe brought some more blitzes, but I mean, the guy's just, he's just very good. He's very good. I don't know that I would say Arkansas secondary took the huge step back. You know, Hudson Clark had some struggles, obviously, pass interference. I mean, there was one time where he was like the receiver was backpedaling and, and Clark, you know, didn't get to him. Um, he's done some good things too, but, you know, he's definitely been, you know, targeted at times. And I guess when you do that a lot, you're going you're gonna to give up some plays. But I still thought that Jalen Catalan played very well. Um, Monteric had some really nice plays overall. I don't know that I would say they took a step back as much as it was Trask and having plenty of time to throw. He was sacked one time. Eric Gregory got to him. Man, my hair's tickling my nose. Eric Gregory, not my nose hair, my my mustache hair. <laughs> um, but uh, Eric Gregory got to him once. They hit, say he had four pressures. I don't know that he had four pressures. You know, I think like there's one time where he's dropping back and setting up a screen. Is that a pressure? I don't think that's a pressure. So – he just had a lot of time to throw. I mean, and I've said that before. Like, I always point back to that Justin Fields breakdown on ESPN where they're talking about he goes to his first progression, his second, his third, his fourth, his fifth. Look at the poise in the pocket, the maturity. And I'm just thinking he has got so much room around him. Nobody's even kind of coming close to pressuring him. Of course he looks poised. Same way with Trask. Although Trask is very good, period. Steve Davis says, Trey, will Trey Knox be coming back from his injury? He's not injured. Ted Martin says, time for Knox to step up. They could use him. This is this is the time they need Knox to step up. Absolutely. He has the, the chance to be a playmaker. Adrian Jones says, Trey Knox. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were saying Trey Knox. Trey Knox said on his Twitter, said that on his Twitter today. I believe he will. Said what? What are you talking about, Adrian? Chase Hogan Jones says, Trey, what do you 
think next year's team will take a real step? Do you think next year's team? It depends. A lot depends on quarterback. You know, is KJ Jefferson the answer? Is Malik the answer? I mean, so much depends on quarterback. It's the hardest position to evaluate in college sport in any sport. NFL too. It is incredibly difficult to evaluate. So a lot depends on that. A lot depends on maybe who decides to come back next year. Does Grant Morgan come back? Does Felipe come back? Does Blake Kern come back? I think he can be an asset to him. Um, Jonathan Marshall, I think, has probably positioned himself to go on. I haven't heard a whole lot of chatter about Myron Cunningham. Maybe that's a potential guy that could come back another year. I mean, I think he's maybe a fringe draft pick. Um, Rakeem, probably gone. Devion could definitely come back. They should have enough time to come back fully for next year. I mean, there are a few there are a few key guys to watch, but I expect them to take steps forward yet yeah, next year. Absolutely. Adrian Jones says they were just as good last year. The guys just didn't buy in. I think there's a, a good point. I think that's a good point. I mean, that was obvious to me. I mean. That was that was obvious. That's what that's the reason that maybe I got so fed up there a third of the way, quarter of the way into the season last year. Well, pretty early. I mean, San Jose State game. I mean, I was scratching my head after the the Portland State one. I was just like, man, close to losing that one against a D two or FCS or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's obvious. Like, you can see games where they competed. They competed against Texas A&M. They competed against Kentucky. They competed against Ole Miss. They just completely let go of the rope and quit on their head coach and coordinator. And, I mean, it's – it's you can say it's players shouldn't have quit. But, again, I say this all the time. You have to have something to rally around. You can't just manufacture momentum. You've got to have somebody you believe in. It's important. Nate Johnson likes my beard. Appreciate that, Nate. Got a little more gray than it used to have just a couple of years ago, but I've earned it. I've earned it the last couple of years. I can guarantee you that. Chase Hogan Jones wants a little more lead in the seat on that O-line. Put it a little differently. Ted Martin says, make sure not to call your roofer today. Yeah, I don't think I'll be doing that anytime soon. <laughs> At least not on the air. I got to call him again. He got a big kick out of it. He actually sent me something back. I think he meant to send it to his buddy, but it was like it was something in Spanish <laughs> about where to go on the video because I sent him, I sent him the video. I was like, look, here's the video of me calling you and stuff. And like he, he sent back, but he, he meant to send it to his buddy, buddy, but it was in Spanish. It was something like go to minuto 1330 or something. Pretty funny. Adrian Jones says Frank takes care of the ball, though. Very few interceptions, hold the ball too long. Yeah, I mean, again, you take the sack over the interception. Isaac Rowley says Felipe, Felipe is the best quarterback Arkansas has had in a long time. Smith's a good running back, and Traylon Burks needs more touches. Agree, agree, agree. Could Darren Turner possibly be moved to tight end? We need help there. I don't know. I think I kind of think that they, they want a bigger body at tight end. It seems to be like that was kind of what they talked about all during – I mean, like, basically – Half the time, the tight end split out. I mean, they, they split him out a ton, you know, or put him directly in the backfield, you know, kind of in a fullback type of role, you know. So he's either like an H-back or he's split out, he's on the line, or he's like kind of like a fullback. So I would think that, you know, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to put Darren Turner at tight end, considering what they want to do at that position. Rocky Carter says, I think it would have closer – I think it would have been closer if Odom – could have concentrated on defense only. Yeah, I think that's possibly right, Rocky. Adrian says Ryan Mallett had a cannon. Yeah, Ryan Mallett had the biggest arm I've ever seen at Arkansas. Some would argue um, – oh, I'm gonna, Joe Ferguson. Some would argue Joe Ferguson. I wasn't around for that, obviously. I'm only 43. Timothy David Long says five wins this season. Isaac Riley said they've got a chance to win these next two. Isaac Riley says our offensive line is young, and I get that, but they look a little like little kids compared to every SOC line. I mean, that's it's absolutely true. Like even you know you see somebody listed maybe at six five three thirty or something, and you look at the guy you know for you know this maybe listed at the same size. You could be built different ways. I mean, some of those guys are just so huge. 
huge. And Arkansas's guys look still a little lean overall, except for Myron Cunningham, except for Ricky Stromberg. You know, I even think Ricky could maybe trim up a little bit. Guy, poor guy's going like, I mean, Ricky Stromberg's weight has been insane. I mean, he's like 320 in high school, 280 in high school. You know, I mean, just like up and down, then like arrives at Arkansas at like 266, <laughs> and then he's up to 311, you know. But I think I think he'll get pretty even, uh, pretty balanced out now that he's at 311. Timothy David Long said, saw the bowl prediction, five wins of Music City Bowl against Purdue. Your thoughts, Trey? I would take a trip to Nashville. I don't know if I get to go, I guess. I don't know how that will work out. But they actually had him against another team in Indiana. They had him playing against uh, Indiana last week, I think. Anthony Jant Tenner says, have they ever thought about putting Knox at tight end again? I don't think that's what they want at tight end. Alan Jeter says, "Are you speak- you're speaking the truth today, Trey. Appreciate that. All right, everybody. Jason, team, we'll, we'll, we'll cut it out here with uh, j- just these couple of comments here. How's actually extra year of eligibility able to uh, going to accept the scholarship total, I guess, says Rashawn K. Johnson. We don't know yet. We don't know what that's going to – how that's going to play out, if they're going to allow some leniency or what, or if it's just for the seniors, if they'll allow leniency or for just one year or how. But I think they definitely – can expect to get some guys back. Jason T. Matt, Matthew says, or excuse me, Tyler Tober says, Trey, I appreciate your, appreciate the house tour Saturday night. <laughs> I didn't have anywhere else to do it. I mean, like, I didn't want to do the flashlight thing that I did on Halloween. I mean, last time, but that last time I did it outside before that, I went off into this field, not too far from Sam Pittman and Chad Morris's old house, out in this field and turned my lights on and like walked all the way to the end of the field and then turned around and started walking back to my car so I'd have some lighting. And I, I did it the Halloween in the neighborhood, but I kind of found myself talking like this. And when I talk like that, that's not me really walking, talking. You know, that's not me like just like pouring it out. That's me like holding, you know, having some restraint. And I didn't want to do that. So I knew in my backyard and I thought, you know, it was a little windy sound, the trees were rustling. Maybe I can get away with talking a little loud. So that's why I did it in the backyard. Jason T. Matthews says, can Browse get some blame for Burke's lack of touches and his untraditional ways of using him? Yeah. Kendall, got to get it to him more. I mean, I don't think – I think he probably realizes that after he saw He's like, dang, we only got him five touches. Yeah, I mean, I think he knows that. But, yeah, sure, he, he can get some blame for that. I mean, Franks could have hit him on that 51-yarder too. <laughs> I would have come right back the next series with that play and see if I could have hit it. Timothy David Long says, so do you think it is beat? Who do you think is the best team in the SEC? Florida, Texas A&M, or Alabama? Probably Alabama. I think that's going to do it, everybody. I've hit my threshold. 55 minutes here. Appreciate you joining me. Again, go to the site tomorrow. Today, for those who are listening, today is Monday. I want you to go to hogsports.com tomorrow, and you're going to like what you see, okay? For those of you who aren't subscribed, I promise you're going to like it. For you other people who don't want to subscribe yet, sign up for the newsletter. Sign up for free text alerts. Hey, we still appreciate our free users. We love We love our subscribers. Our subscribers make everything possible for us. So if you ever wonder how you can support us, do sign up. But we really appreciate you guys, you free users also. We are a dual revenue company. Revenue from subscribers, obviously, and advertising. So we appreciate you free users, so I don't want that to uh, to go unsaid. But uh, obviously, we love you subscribers. Thank you for so much. Thank you for supporting us over the years. Last, I mean, Some of you guys have been with us for 17 years, but I don't care if you've been with us for a month or 17 years or whatever. We would take anything we can get on subscribers. We, we really appreciate it. And um, we really love when people come back at us and say, hey, man, didn't know what you had here. I wish I'd subscribed years ago. You guys do a great job, and I can guarantee you this, we're always going to work harder than anybody else. 
if somebody else is working harder than us, then we're going to find a way to outwork them. That's just how we do things at Hog Sports. Appreciate my team over there, Danny West, Mason Show, and, of course, Curtis Wilkerson. Everybody does a great job. All right, everybody. I think we did the show today. My voice is almost gone, so that's almost how I can <laughs> know without even using a clock. So, appreciate everybody for their questions. We'll be back with you guys on Thursday, and hopefully we'll have – I'm thinking maybe we'll get Billy Embody from – um, the LSU side on 24-7, go, G-E-A-U-X, 247. Uh, hopefully we'll get him on uh, to share some insight on the LSU Tigers. He does a great job over there. And, uh, of course, we'll have Kurt Wilkerson on. We'll have Danny West on. And we've got some big news coming up, too, that I want to share. Hopefully we'll share it maybe – might share, share it Thursday. But um, we got some big things planned for Curtis Wilkerson and his basketball coverage. So look out for that. All right, everybody. It's been Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com. We'll catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.